everybody, this is Whitney Moore. Welcome to Sci-Fi Wire's Metal Crush. We are going to be talking about all things horror, sci-fi, comics, Stephen King, and metal with the one and only Scott Ian from Anthrax and Motor Sister. Then we are going to surprise him by bringing on one of his favorite actors and friends, Aaron Douglas of Battlestar Galactica fame. We also have some revelations and a metal movie flashback. This is Sci-Fi Wire's Metal Crush. I am here with Anthrax's Scott Ian. I'm so, so excited to talk to you today, dude. It sounds like we have a lot of nerdy interests that are common. How are you? Good, good. How are you? <laughs> I, you know, how do you even answer that question these days? What have you been doing during this quarantine time? What's been keeping you busy? I have a, my own radio show on Sirius that I've been doing lots of interviews on, but also music, of course. I think it's the longest I've been home, you know, straight without having to travel somewhere. The time with my family has been amazing. We all are involved in music, but constantly making music in the house. Busy doing virtual videos, these I call them Insta Jams, where I've been jamming with lots of other dudes from other bands. Some really cool things, like we did a thing with Lee Vink from Fear, like sang with us, and I had Mike Patton from Big Lamore and Mr. Bungle do a song, and I seemingly have been busier than I've ever been even though I'm home doing nothing. But I understand Anthrax might be working on some new music. So we had already started working on stuff with the intent of finishing it up in the springtime of this year, of 20, and then maybe getting in the studio and either having a record out later this year or early 21. But obviously all those plans have now changed. We have still been working on stuff through the magic of the you know internet. We could do a lot over Zoom and FaceTime and sending music back and forth through email and all that. But uh, we need to really get in the room and work on the arrangements and really play something, you know, like 30 times until you really understand it and feel like, okay, this is, this is where this arrangement needs to be. So that's kind of the hold up at this point. But we certainly have a lot of material, which makes me very excited about when we can actually get in the room together and start, yes. you know, bashing it out. Well, Lord knows we need something to look forward to these days. That's what keeps me going is knowing <laughs> when new music is going to drop. So I will be eagerly awaiting that. Right happening. on, right on. Thank you. <laughs> well, here at Metal Crush, you know we love metal, but we also love comics, horror, sci-fi, anything genre stuff. And I know that that's very near and dear to your heart as well. Can you talk a little bit about your love of comics and horror and sci-fi growing up? Horror was first because... I was already watching horror movies, I think, before I could read. In New York City growing up, we had this thing called Creature Feature and another thing called Chiller Theater that were on the local channels. And they would play like old Universal movies and stuff like that. I was going to ask about Universal Classic Monsters. Do you have a favorite? It's between Wolfman and, and uh, Creature from the Black Lagoon. I mean, I, I, I love all of them. I mean, I was way into horror. And as soon as I could read, I was pulling marvel books off the racks at the candy store down the street from where i lived in queens marvel quickly became the biggest thing in my life even more than horror because i couldn't actually go to see horror movies yet when i was seven in the early 70s but comics i could read the crap out of them so marvel quickly took over my life that was my life it was comics and horror and sci-fi and guitar and skateboarding and and the Yankees. When I started taking guitar more seriously, like let's say by 76 or 77, so now I'm like 13 years old, and uh, I was way more into music, and my own music, I had discovered Kiss at this point. When I first saw them on TV in like late 75, it was all neatly wrapped up in a fiery, bloody, horrific package for me, sure. you know, because it's like, oh my God, look at these dudes and listen to what they're doing. And for the next three years, they owned my soul. I mean, literally <laughs> from 75 to 78, it was all about Kiss. I think that that's a very universal experience if you grew up in the 70s and 80s because Kiss kind of enveloped the pageantry, the blood of heavy metal and horror and comics. So it's kind of like, a perfect intersection between all those things that you hold beloved. Now, when you were finally allowed, when you were old enough to go see scary movies, do you remember some of your early favorites? There was a, a theater right across the street from us in Queens. So at a very young age, my friends and I started sneaking in to movies that we probably shouldn't have been sneaking into. Um, definitely went to see The Exorcist as a kid. You know, when I say kid, you know, 13 probably, which I think is old enough to see that. Rosemary's Baby, Race with the Devil. Do you remember that? Oh, that yeah. Movie? 
That was like a big one for me. No movies ever really scared me, but there was something about that movie because it was more based in reality, just some people in an RV and they happen across these Satanists having their ritual. The Hills of Eyes, I remember going to see in the theater when I shouldn't have um, figured like late 70s going into the early to mid 80s as far as horror is concerned, mm. to me is still the best period for horror there's ever been. Um, I was already old enough essentially to go to see R-rated movies at, at that point at 16 myself. Nobody was asking me for ID. You know, I was seeing everything when it came out from Halloween to Evil Dead. Uh, of course, you know, all the 80s slasher stuff, Nightmare on Elm Street and Friday the 13th. and. I mean, all of that stuff I was going to see when they, when they came out, like opening day. I also understand that you are a huge Stephen King fan, and I am so excited to talk with you about this. Um, obviously, his Dark Tower book series has influenced Anthrax's music. I know at least two Anthrax songs um, that kind of reference it. How Pretty much every, every song I've ever written. <laughs> I got into King early because of my mom. My, I think my mom had read Carrie. And uh, and then she was like, you should check this out. I was probably 12 or something when I read that book. And I was just completely blown away by it. And, that, and by the time I read it, The Shining was already out. The Stand may have already been out. So I was excited because I had other books to go to. My mom bought me the first Dark Tower book, The Gunslinger. I remember getting into that book and being like, wow, this is different. And then it, of course, immediately grabbing me. I was a big Lord of the Rings fan. So this immediately opened that door for me and touched that nerve. And I was hooked knowing that this was going to be some larger world that he was building. Um, and uh, I couldn't wait for more. And, you know, lucky for me over the course of what 20 odd, 25, 30 years, you know, he, it became uh, his magnum opus and it encompasses everything in some way, shape or form encompassed everything he'd ever written because he even put himself into the series. Roland is actually dealing with Stephen King and I have to go <laughs> back and reread it to figure out how the continuity and how it was, it was just so, so incredible. Yeah, I, I would say the Dark Tower for me, when people of course ask me a lot, what's your favorite King book? And I'm like, well, if I could count all seven books, at just the Dark Tower, that's my favorite King thing ever. Stephen King actually mentions Anthrax in book three of the series um, in, in the Wastelands. Did you know yeah. that that was going to happen? Did Hell you no. Surprise? Oh my god, it was a surprise? As I'm reading that book came out in 91, the day it comes out, I have it in my hands, the big fat hardcover, and I'm reading it. And I get to that part where Eddie is describing the sound of the giant bear alarm yeah, the sound of that alarm being as loud as like going to see Anthrax in New Jersey when he was a kid. And I, I like literally like, what? Like, and I'm like looking for someone and I'm just, there's no one to show. And, and there's no internet and there's no social media to share this on in 1991. Like, I was just, it was insane. So which of course then in my brain turns into years later when he wrote himself into the book and I'm like, wait a minute. So anthrax now exists in that world like what king is yes. saying is that somehow i exist in that world that he has created so i, I, I exist my favorite heavy metal fandom moment yeah ever. i exist in a world where roland exists everything i've ever done creatively stanley and stephen king are the two biggest influences on me and there's no way i ever would have even had the balls to say i'll try writing lyrics if it wasn't for everything you know, they had done for me. We have more with Scott Ian in just a bit, but right now, let's get into some revelations. Okay, let's get into some revelations for this edition of Sci-Fi Wire's Metal Crush. We've got a mini metal god, a rocker and artist collaboration, skillets Eden 2, and fashionable footwear. <laughs> I am so excited because my Super 7 reaction figure family that already includes King Diamond and Venom's Black Metal Demon will soon be expanding with none other than the metal god himself, Rob Halford. Halford is so important to the history of metal music, not only musically, but also with his impact on metal fashion and style. Judas Priest were without question the first metal band to ditch the bell bottoms in denim and embrace the leather and stud look that we all love today. 
This new reaction figure captures that look perfectly, and it even comes with a microphone and Rob's iconic leather whip. It's adorable. If playing with this new toy isn't enough Halford for you, though, the Metal God is about to release his autobiography, Confess, which is co-written by Ian Gittins. It comes out September 29th. Pre-order that book and the reaction Rob Halford figure right now. Do it, you doinks. Bassist Chris Wise, who is currently in the supergroup The Hollywood Vampires, featuring legendary performers Alice Cooper, Joe Perry, and also Johnny Depp, and has formerly worked with Ozzy, Ace Frehley, The Cult, and even once auditioned for Metallica, which can be seen in the film Some Kind of Monster, recently announced a dark, multi-dimensional project that revolves around a vigilante, vampiric owl character. Cool. On the audio side of things, we can expect some bass-centric work, which includes some soundtrack-like sounds, which at times include him playing an upright bass with a bow and delivering some emotional vocals. The accompanying visuals are by the incredible artist Russell Marks. The plan is for a collaboration that will be in the form of an album and comic book, hopefully to be released sometime in the not-too-distant future. In the meantime, we encourage everybody to visit chriswise.com to sample the chilling sounds and sights. The band Skillet is ready to release the follow-up to their 2019 graphic novel Eden. Eden 2, which comes out this September 11th, will give fans more of what they liked in the first book, including more action, more surprises, more suspense, and more great art from illustrator Chris Hunt, who has also done work for IDW Comics, Vertigo Comics, and many others. KISS recently announced on Twitter that official replicas of their stage outfits can be bought on the site kissreplicas.com. One of the first products they are offering is the Demon Destroyer official boots which are available for $649 plus shipping. And if that price seems like it might lick up a bit too much of your savings, don't worry because KISS is offering a three-month payment plan. The boots are made of eco leather, aka pleather, metal, stones, and other materials. They also feature a zipper on the backside and cushion padding on the inside for maximum comfort while you slay on stage. These boots are not only the ideal footwear for that perfect Gene Simmons Halloween costume, but they're also great for walks in the park, weddings, funerals, relaxing at home, the list goes on and on. And if you happen to trip and kill yourself while wearing these stunning shit kickers, don't worry because there's always the official Kiss Coffin. Also, I wear a size 7. Just throwing that out there. And those were this week's revelations for Sci-Fi Wire's Metal Crush. Alright, let's get back into our chat with Scott Ian of Anthrax and I have a little surprise for him. I know that I Am The Law is influenced by Judge Dredd, which is a great, great comic. What memories do you have of discovering Judge Dredd? And also, you have written Lobo, which is amazing. A lot of metalheads, of course, are huge uh, Lobo fans. And so, talk a little bit about your love of comics. Yeah, like I said earlier, as soon as I could read, I started grabbing comics. And I grew up on Stan Lee and Jack Kirby and Steve Ditko and that like kind of silver age of Marvel and then getting into the 70s. and. I was a major comic book geek. The first time we went to England um, to play in like 86, I discovered 2000 AD and this character, Judge Dredd, and just like, wow, this is like, this is my guy. So Forbidden Planet in New York City used to get 2000 AD issues in, so I would buy up every one they would get. And like I said, this was early on in my lyric writing career, so uh, I was so into Judge Dredd at that period of time, like 86, when that I Am The Law was written, and I'm like, I'm writing this. So nobody knows, in America, nobody knew Judge Dredd was yet, except for like real comic, like the dudes <laughs> that worked at Forbidden Planet. And nobody knew, unless you lived in the UK, but I knew, and Judge Dredd was so metal. It was just everything about it connected with me on a metal level, and yeah, I had, the song just had to be written. And then Lobo was just a dream come true, my manager, asking if I'd like to take a meeting at DC and that, for what? Like, to hang out and like talk about Batman? So I sat down with a bunch of editors and they asked me if I'd be into writing a book. If you had any character in the DC universe, who would you want to write? I said, well, Batman. And, and then I just started like kind of pitching Batman ideas and like, well, no, you can't do that with Batman. No, you can't do that with Batman. And I'm like, all right, how about this? What characters can I do whatever I want with. They're like, what do you think of Lobo? I said, I love Lobo. He's the main man. Lobo, do whatever you want. I was like, great. And I, I will say this even, right around this time is when those Marvel Zombies books were the uh -huh. biggest, they were flying off the shelves. It was the biggest thing in comics at the time. One of the editors said to me, maybe you could get zombies into your story somehow because <laughs> we've been pitching zombie books, but the bosses at the time, 
they wouldn't let them do anything zombies because Marvel was doing zombies. So they're like, we can't do it, but you're out, you can. And I'm like, hey, I love zombies. I'll try and make it work. And of course I did when I sent them to hell. So yeah, it was, uh, it was just, it was so much fun. And getting to work with Sam Keith was like a dream come true. That is so cool. You are such a bona fide nerd, Scott. I love it. We've talked <laughs> about you. horror. We've talked about comics. Um, let's talk a little bit about sci-fi. I understand that you are also a Battlestar Galactica fan and that you have a fun story from back in 2006 where you visited the set. <laughs> Man, that, that show was so great. And uh, yeah, we were on tour. We were playing uh, Vancouver. We had the day off. And, you know, we knew this was coming up. So we had some people reach out and phone calls were made. And then we found out, yeah, you could come for a set visit. And we were lucky that, you know, they were shooting at the time. So like Katie Sackhoff was there and, and Aaron Douglas Chief was there and Edward James almost like the whole cast was there. The day we went down, we got to see the Cylon ship before like anyone had even seen it. At, and we had to sign NDAs and they're like, please, you can't post any. We're like, we won't, we won't. We don't want to ruin it for anybody. It was just such a mind-blowing experience. And I'm still like, uh, uh, Aaron, who pl uh, played Chief, we're still friends. We're still, we're still in you know, touch. He was the big metalhead. He comes, we hadn't met him yet. And he comes running in and he's like, he's like, don't listen to any of these other people. I'm, I'm the only metalhead here. I'm the real, <laughs> I like, he goes, I, and it's true. He, I mean, he was, he was like, I don't know it all. Stand by, Scott. Are you? Um, my Zoom is like glitching out right now. Um, yeah. <laughs> hey, buddy. <laughs> oh my God, we've been hacked by one of the final five Cylons. Oh Ladies God, and gentlemen, let's welcome Aaron Douglas of Battlestar fame to our call. Aaron, thanks yeah. for hacking in. Thanks for having me. This is uh, this is such a cool thing. I love uh, Sky so much. Uh, it's great to be on with you guys. You hear me telling the story how you came in, you're like, I'm the fan, don't listen to these other jerks. <laughs> no, I missed that part. I've got my whole story about that. Aaron, let's hear the story from your perspective. Okay, this is what I remember. Uh, when Battlestar was at its height, we had all kinds of people that were fans of the show and they would show up, band people, athletes, other celebrities. And, and it got to the point where it was like, hey, did you meet the so-and-so? And you're like, oh man, I just, I wanna get my makeup off and go home. So. <laughs> I was getting on a plane that night and I had just wrapped a scene and I was walking back to my trailer and one of the transpo guys says, hey, did you see the band? And I thought, ah, oh, not another band. And so I just kept on walking and, uh, and then this little voice inside my head said, no, 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 find out what band it is. So I turned around and I said, what, what band is it? And he said, Anthrax. I ran to him, I grabbed him by the collar. You better not be screwing with me, man. <laughs> and I said, where are they? They're in H. Okay, which is the CIC and the hallways and the, and the ready room, the pilot room and stuff like that. So I go run into the stage and I open the door and they're not shooting in there, so it's quiet, but the lights are on and I can hear voices mumbling. So I'm running and running and running. And I realize that they're in this one room and in order to get there, I'd have to run all the way around, but all of our sets had panels that pulled off so you could just shoot a camera through the wall so I just rip off this panel and I poke my head through and there and I see Scott turns and he looks at me and we did the same thing at the same time. Anthrax, chief. And then uh, <laughs> I, like, I crawled through the thing and uh, man, it was like one of my favorite days on set, just uh, wheeling around, giving these guys a tour and, and uh, yeah, that was, that was real special. Cause I grew up with, I grew up with these boys. They were the, them and Metallica and Maiden and Sabbath and, they were the uh, the anthem in the in the dressing room when I when I played hockey growing up and, and getting dressed and I remember the first time somebody played Cotton a Mosh and a bunch of meatheads in the middle of the dressing room in their skates banging into each other I'm like what is happening right now the best worst part of that that day was right at the end of we were hanging out in the tour and stuff Scott says you got to come and hang out backstage and I was getting on a plane that night and I just went like oh I can't oh. And then I was like that 10 year old boy who goes, mom, Scott and the boys are going to the water park. Can I go too? We're going to visit your grandma today. You remember? Oh, I can't go. I was crushed. But Scott being the unbelievable, wonderful person he is, has, has dragged me to a lot of cool places. And I got to see a lot of cool shows and got to do a lot of cool things. So uh, I'm eternally grateful for that. And, 
I missed that one day, but he's made up for it. It is so amazing that you guys were able to forge a friendship from the set visit and from your mutual fandoms. I've just been grilling Scott about his love for genre and sci-fi stuff. Um, And I would love to hear from you, Aaron. What are you up to and where can people find you? I was about to start a show in March called The Power for uh, Amazon Prime. And it got shut down because of what we're dealing with. And rumor has it we're going to fire back up in... Uh, August sometime. So I'm just waiting awesome. for us to fire back up and and do that. In the meantime, I am uh, writing comic books for Aftershock Comics. So that takes awesome. up my time. And yeah, that's nice. kind of fun. Well, I'm so, so glad that I got to sit with you guys today. I, I love uh, Battlestar and I love Anthrax. So best of both worlds. Um, you guys take care of yourselves. Stay safe out there. And thank you for joining me. Oh, thank, thank you. you for having me. <laughs> Give my love to Pearl and Rival Buddy. Good to see you. Good to talk to you. See you, you look great. Yeah, Bye. you too, man. A massive thanks to Scott Ian of Anthrax and Motor Sister and our surprise guest, Aaron Douglas of Battlestar Galactica for joining us. That ruled, I'm so excited. Right now, it's time for a nightmarish trip back to 1987 for this metal movie flashback. After 1985's sequel, A Nightmare on Elm Street 2's lackluster box office performance, the stakes could not have been higher or sharper for one of the most feared horror icons of all time. But in 1987, with A Nightmare on Elm Street 3, Dream Warriors, Wes Craven and director Chuck Russell delivered one of the greatest and most successful horror sequels of the decade. This movie was metal, not only because of the seven inch metal blades protruding from Freddy's fingers, but for the spooky ghost nun, sleepless teenage outcasts, dumb grown-ups, a hunted metal ward, the murder of Zsa Zsa Gabor, mom getting decapitated but continuing to talk, Freddy pulling out a kid's tendons and muscles and making him dance like a marionette puppet, Patricia Arquette's screen, Larry Fishburne before the great Lawrence rebrand, and not one but two songs by the commercial metal band Dokken. One of them in the final credits being a heavier alternate mix of the song Dream Warriors than what later appeared on their 1987 album Back for the Attack. In the Elm Street movies following, Freddy jumped the shark and became more of a funny jokester than a scary murderer. Having said that, let's give a special shout out to the soundtrack of A Nightmare on Elm Street 5, which did have some good rock and metal, including the song Bring Your Daughter to the Slaughter by Bruce Dickinson. A year later, he would re-record the song with his band Iron Maiden, and it shot up to number one in the United Kingdom. That's it, we're done. Thanks to Scott Ian and Aaron Douglas for hanging with me and to you for watching. Be sure to listen and subscribe to Sci-Fi Wire's Metal Crush podcast wherever you get your podcasts, and follow Sci-Fi Wire on Instagram and Twitter.